So I'm very glad to be here on this conference. In fact, I think it's not 60, it's 61, but <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> we are to celebrate this great theory. Uh, you have already heard from David Gross, I was told, uh, that Young Mills field is a really self-consistent, good field theory in four-dimensional space-time. And I will add to this con conviction some more words on the <clears throat> technical level. Namely, uh, I will speak about one way of describing what is perturbation theory and what is renormalization. Not using uh, uh, can, can counter terms and so on in very realistic way. The mechanism for that can be based on, on the, some generating functional. We know that there are two competing stories about quantum field theory. One is that field theory is based on green functions, and another is that it's based on asymmetrics from the beginning. Let's say first is Schwinger, second is Feynman, but of course many people there. So I follow Feynman. I prefer to have a generating functional which produces you as matrix from the beginning. And this functional is uh, the background field functional. In Young Mills theory, it's difficult to introduce currents to produce green functions. Green functions are gauge dependent and not very natural thing. But with external field, which is gauge invariant, gauge covariant, things are much better. So I will describe you some picture of uh, how to regularize and understand this uh, functional of external young Mills field. The background field method was introduced by many people and uh, I will describe you the story. I will uh, say my, my variant, which I had somehow from the beginning when I was uh, working on Young Mills field. And uh, it was based on ideas of Feynman. If you read Feynman paper on, in this, uh, his talk in Warsaw, famous talk when he first introduced fictitious particles, then you will see that he will always refer to functional integral with, with integration of trajectories which have some uh, classical asymptotics at, infin at infinite times. And so in terms of this asymptotics, one parameterizes the functional and then calculate this matrix. So let me begin. First notations, usual space time, Young Mills field is described as uh, matrix valued vector field, there's famous formula for curvature, action which is trace of f minus squared, and alpha is coupling constant, which is dimensionless. So we are to investigate, oh, excuse me, the functional integral, where you integrate over fields, including these fictitious particles and so on. And uh, the main thing in Feynman idea was that you are to integrate over fields A, which has some prescribed asymptotics at minus and plus infinity in time. And so the functional will be function of these asymptotic fields. <clears throat> in the background field method, we are just shifting the variable of integration. You can say how you change integral when you just shift it. Value of integration, uh, the integration variable, but uh, we have to remember about boundary conditions. So in, if you choose B as a arbitrary field, no, no, if you change B in such a way that it takes the asymptotic behavior of fields A at minus and plus infinity, and small a is addition, a small a is here addition, then uh, you will get that this functional, functional integral will be fu functional of b, 
and then B is parameterized by asymptotic values, you can calculate this matrix without any uh, lemon semantic Zimmerman, without any reduction formulas, just this matrix from the beginning. And of course, uh, if you develop this functional in perturbation theory, you'll have classical action, which I call W minus one, then uh, one loop corrections, higher loop corrections, and where the, uh, this is classical action, and one loop correction is given in terms of determinants of operator of vector particles and scalar fermions, fictitious particles. So minus here and plus here, which is very important. <laughs> this gives you the one loop correction. The operators are vector operators, just Laplace and plus this famous term f minu times something, and uh, fictitious particle is this just Laplacian, delta mu squared, where delta mu is covering derivative with respect to external field. And now we are to investigate this functional. Uh, one, uh, usually people say uh, to get perturbation theory, one must develop this in integral in stationary phase method in the vicinity of B, which is classical field. I say it's not, in fact, it's not good for field theory. In field theory, we have not only actions of our objects, but also self-action. And this self-action is to be taken into account. Uh, in Hamiltonian way, we are to say that we are to work with exact one particle states to define its matrix and so on. And so one way of taking this into account is to take B not a classical solution but some other function, which still have proper asymptotic conditions, but doesn't satisfy classical equation. Uh, I will uh, tell you what is my choice in, the, in a moment. But uh, first about the diagram technique, when you develop in the vicinity of some B, then you will have, you are to calculate only vacuum diagrams because all the physical content is in variable B you'll get legs when you will differentiate by B and so on. And there are lines, well, excuse me, lines for uh, vector particles, for fictitious particles, and vertices of young mills, and vertex of fictitious particle type young mills. These things all depend on B, and you have to calculate these vacuum diagrams. Uh, of course, <laughs> there are di divergences, and uh, there are a lot of competing methods of regularizing, and I like so-called uh, the method which is called proper time method by Fock. Uh, now people say about heat kernels yes, and something like that. This is a very long sto story about development of these things, but paper of Falk of 37 was repeated by Schwinger in his uh, paper in physical review with references, so it's no problem. And uh, then somehow it was forgotten. But it's remembered in Russia, and so I just want to stress the value of Falk here. So the, uh, it's based on the um, on the formula that you can write determinants or inverse operators in terms of operator e to the minus ms. S is proper time, m is operator in question. So log determinant is this integral and uh, inverse is this integral. And of course, these integrals are diverging in our four dimensional space. And the way, one way of regularization is to introduce uh, they are divergent at small s, because for instance, the m, the green function, well, this function will have uh, one over f squared singularity at small s, so you are to uh, regularize it somehow. By dimensions, I call this regularization parameter lambda square, lambda, which is, has dimension of mass, and so S has dimension of space, and so that's uh, one over lambda squared is uh, this regularization. 
And then you have to go to the limit when lambda goes to infinity, where you can do it. This method is not completely implemented until now. I made some exercises in my old age, and <laughs> with some success, some no success, but nevertheless, uh, more popular method of dimensional regularization also can be used. I will speak about it a little bit later. When I began, until when I began, five of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's consider first one loop. The sum of the determinants can be written up to constant. Constant, of course, is not interesting uh, as integral of a proper time of the functional, which has asymptot for which we know asymptotic for small s. And this asymptotic is proportional to classical action, constant term. And there are term which is when s, uh, which is order s at s equal to zero. So uh, only this you, you re, uh, divergence. And so if you regularize this divergence, so integrate from one over lambda squared to one over mu squared, and then, then you will get full contribution of uh, classical and one loop as one over alpha plus beta one times log of lambda over mu. So lambda is regularization parameter, mu is just normalization parameter. You, you cannot write logarithm <laughs> of dimensional things without dividing by something. So mu is just auxiliary parameter. And then you'll get correction, which term which is finite for lambda equal to infinity, depending on mu, of course. It's written here. So you integrate the first, second term on all interval and uh, full contribution from one over mu squared to infinity. And now we have extremely important property for young Mills field is that this coefficient beta one is negative. You know, uh, not <laughs> there are more, mostly here young people that don't know about the story of uh, electrodynamics when this parameter was positive, which prompted Landau to forbid field theory, at least in Soviet Union. Fortunately, I was living in, Len in Leningrad at that time, not in Moscow. <laughs> so it was far from him. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, this uh, influenced the development of physics very much, of course. That field theory was somehow taken uh, behind other things, theory of asymmetrics and so on, many, many development. But then it happened that in Young Mills field, this coefficient is negative. This is uh, famous result of Gross and Wilczek, Pulitzer, and Toft also. Maybe it's not so much known, but Toft around the same year, 73, had this statement also. And so with this, we see that divergent part of one, one loop effective action is one over alpha plus beta one log lambda over mu, and then finite term. And now, because beta one is negative, then one over alpha plus beta one log makes sense if you choose alpha properly. And so the main idea, which in fact Landau was advertised, he didn't like subtractions and counter terms and so on. He was just saying that regularization is that you have parameters in your Lagrangian, depending on the regularization parameter, if you have limit, then it's good. If you don't have limit, then something is bad. So you have to choose alpha of lambda as a proper, as particular function of lambda, such that this contribution will be finite. By the way, calculating beta one in this formalism, in proper time formalism, is very simple. So it takes only two pages, and you get this famous 11 thirds. <laughs> nice. I don't know why 11 appeared, but nevertheless. Polyakov have some speculations that 11 is 22 over 2, and 22 is 26 minus 4. <laughs> but until now, it's not yet realized. 
in proper way. So you have to take alpha properly so that the limit, this sum, this sum, which was on the previous slide, is finite. And you have to take it also proportional to log lambda. But once more, you have to divide this lambda by something. And you have to divide by another constant, m, where m is new parameter. This is, I will stress it more several times, this is what is called dimensional transmutation. Indeed, now you have uh, your infinite term being equal to uh, renormalized coupling constant, which also has the, uh, the same formula, but instead of lambda, you take mu, and instead of m, and m is here. This is now your new coupling constant, which forgets the original coupling constant and just having this m here. What is m? m is a integral of famous gelman law equation. In my approximation, this gelman law equation is just this. And so this is the first order differential equation. Uh, which uh, has a parameter, which has integral, and this m is integral of that equation, nothing else. Now, but comparing this formula and this, you see that alpha renormalized, which depends on this reference momentum, satisfies the same equation. So in fact, unrenormalized charge, alpha of lambda, and renormalized charge, alpha of mu, are two different points on the same trajectory. There are there is no difference between unrenormalized charge and renormalized charge. This is feature of young mills. This is very beautiful feature of young mills because of this logarithmic divergences. So in one loop, having this new parameter, M, you, can, you have your uh, functional of external field B as finite object. And you can now calculate many things and but instead, instead of dimensionless parameter alpha, you have now dimensional parameter m. I think that this, uh, but m appears very trivially. M is just scale, because uh, if you rescale everything, then uh, you can cancel m and so on. So uh, in this way, at least in one loop, but it will follow for all loops, uh, young mills theory is not a family of theories. Mathematically, we say that classical young mills is just a family of theories parameterized by coupling constant, which is dimensionless constant. In case of after quantization, because you cancel infinity, because you're, the infinity breaks the scale invariance of classical young mills theory, you are getting uh, M, parameter m, which is nothing but scale. I think that this mechanism of appearing mass is much more preferable to uh, Higgs phenomena, but that's my own preference. Yeah. Well, if you go to two loops, then uh, something happens, namely that two loop also it's one, one could expect that two loop will be get contribution with proportion to square of logarithm. No, it has only linear term with another coefficient, well, excuse me, with another coefficient beta two, which is also negative. And instead of 11, we have 17, <laughs> something strange. This simple numbers. But uh, this is the result. And now the hypothesis which I propose, you know, I called my talk scenario because many things are not done yet, but I want to understand the general picture in which uh, I would, would work. And hypothesis that it's possible to get this unrenormalized charge alpha in such a way that full functional will not depend on lambda. And so uh, we will uh, consider the limit when lambda goes to infinity easily, which uh, will give us uh, the finite result just only because of this simple thing 
I already referred, the beta one is negative. Hmm? <laughs> and beta one, beta two already also, yes. But for beginning, we need beta one, yes. 11 thirds, <laughs> not 17 thirds. This is a, really a great thing that we have first field theory in four dimensions, which is finite. And infinities, which were plugged with field theory for all the history from the 30s, are not bad. They are good here. Because the main thing which infinity do is they change the scale invariance of classical theory and give us dimension transmutation, give us scale, and give us this parameter m. But as I say, this m does not enter, it enters very simply. It's just a scale, just scale and nothing. Any, any, any entity which has dimension of m in some order is, must be multiplied by this m, and others, they will be just numbers. So the young Mills theory is just pure number theory. No, no parameters. And great thing is that infinity plus dimensional, plus uh, asymptotic freedom give us this property. So the hypothesis is that one can find alpha of lambda in such a way that W doesn't depend on lambda. And well, so uh, the normalized charge will have the form unrenormalized plus this first term and then other terms where we, we have um, alpha. It's forward series, of course, in which the, uh, we have polynomials in these logarithms. Uh, I have seen, uh, well, calculation of three loops uh, and two loops, uh, but in different setting and so-called dimensional regularization. And I will comment about connection of this formula and this dimensional regularization formula, uh, which people were calculating. But, on, uh, but this formula, unfortunately, is not done yet. I, I remember I spent, when I first realized that regularization is important, <laughs> I spent a lot of time on this two loop in this uh, formulation. I get, instead of, so, 17 multiplied by 2, 34, and uh, I, I was to get 68, and I get 62, something like that. <laughs> but, so it's a good exercise for young people to calculate in proper time method the two and three loops and so on. It's still a nice exercise. So the, the, this formula is still hypothetical. On the other hand, of course, this function satisfies Gelman law equation with the coefficient beta 1 and beta 2, which we already have discussed, and there are high coefficients. And then uh, in the previous, previous coefficients, C for uh, n and m are not equal, are to be calculated in terms of, of coefficients of, of Gelman law function. So uh, if I rewrite beta Gelman law equation for this alpha of lambda in this way for coefficient m, then uh, uh, I will get, uh, I can make a lot of calculations. For instance, take higher order terms, you will get a nice equation like that, which you can solve with beginning with beta 2. Because in two loops, we also have only first order of logarithm. And then get things are summed up in a nice formula with coefficient beta 1 over beta, beta 2 over beta 1. And uh, this log. I want to comment that, uh, in fact, from general theory of differential equations, the important coefficients in Gelman law equation are only beta 1 and beta 2. Others are, and it's somehow reflected in my formula that uh, I have first orders of logarithm only with beta 1 and beta 2. 
when you have higher order of logarithm, you can change this and so other coefficients are to be changed maybe and so on. So I think it's still a challenge to understand how physics finally depends only on beta one and beta two. Uh, I don't have, I have some proposals, but they're still not very good and we are to understand it better. You know, I began to understand it only when I was three years ago, maybe. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, you knew it all the time, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, so all together taken, the effects affection can be now rewritten as a uh, functional, uh, as a power series in terms of renormalized charge. All coefficients are finite. And so this is our finite ver version of of this uh, asymmetrics, generating functional for asymmetrics, which is finite. Of course, sum is infinite, so one can say, <laughs> but but there are no there are no infinities, explicit infinities. And now, what about this parameter mu? It turns out that it's also fictitious, and that the full term, full uh, full functional, doesn't depend doesn't depend on mu. Uh, this, of course, imposed a lot of conditions on the exactly what I told you that uh, the coefficients of power, higher powers of logarithm, are, are expressive. They are beta one and beta two, and uh, so there is no. The scale is not here. The the ref, reference scale is not here. Mu physics does not depend on mu, and. Uh, only parameter m, which was just normalization param parameter is here. Now, uh, so we call alpha of mu running coupling constant. It has, it's a function, but the result of this running is not interesting. So when people discuss what happens uh, when uh, mu becomes small, I think it's meaningless because we still are to have the one over lambda be positive, and so this mu must be more than m, for instance. So no infrared behavior of this running coupling constant. Moreover, I will say a little bit more drastic thing that also we don't have notion of weak coupling or strong coupling. There is just one theory, one numerical theory. That's very important uh, in distinction of classical young mills and quantum young mills. Well, now some comments on dimensional regularization. Instead of uh, regularizing lambda, we introduce uh, small dimension smaller than four. Then the corresponding development of normalized charge will be also similar to previous ones. But uh, if you want the, the same beta uh, Gelman law equation, then coefficients Q, well, coefficient D, but were here, and coefficients uh, in my previous slides are different by some numbers. And uh, so when Jack and Osborne calculated beta 2 in dimensional regularization, they got 34, and I was, I was to get it 68 because there is this function 2, the coefficient 2 in this. It was also have taken some time to realize that dimensional regularization and the hypothetical lambda regularization have uh, coefficients which are different by some integer numbers and so on, which one must introduce here. So in particular, you know, one half, one third, and then B22 two two is one six beta one and beta two. I was quite amazed. Uh, there is a very long article by some young Dutch people uh, who calculated three loops in dimensional regularization, and they have numbers, and they did not mention that, that they got this beta 2, 2, which was just product of beta 1 and beta 2. You take their numbers, multiply, divide by 6, <laughs> and fortunately, you are getting exactly what, what one needs. So, ah. Oh. Conclusion already, yeah. So, uh, 
So I describe you just the uh, thing which we are to, I think we are still to do because there is no statements which, well, David was saying yes, of course, yeah, but it's not in textbooks until now. Why? I don't know. When you take textbook, you'll see discussion infinities, counter terms, subtractions, and so on. It's old fashioned. <laughs> we are just to. This was repulsive for me from the beginning. This is maybe why I did not calculate what you calculated. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, uh, I think that this approach through uh, external field formalism is very natural and leads to uh, results which can be understood. So let me recapitulate. So what this story teaches us. It teaches us that infinities from time to time are good, not bad. Infinities are not the mathematical uh, infinities which you formally subtract or regularize and so on. They are important for, import, for very important feature of Young Mills field. They are important to introduce dimensional transmutation. And this can be done only because of asymptotic freedom. So this beta one is negative. That these two things are very important. Renormalization now in Young Mills. So it's also very important that the only infinity, well, the only infinities are proportional to classical action. So all renormalization is reduced to renormalization of coupling constant. There is nothing else. And mass appears not as a massive term, but as a parameter when you do this regularization. So, so as I say, effective action is indeed a very suitable object for description of renormalization. Renormalization is realized via choice of dependence of coupling constant on cutoff momentum. And as a result, dependence of action of coupling constant is essentially eliminated. You are getting only this new scale, but you can use units <laughs> such that the scale is one, and then all young Mills theory is just pure numbers. You calculate these numbers. <laughs> How you do it? Well, we'll learn from, <laughs> from Professor Kreutz, but they're just numbers which you have to calculate. I think this is extremely important feature of uh, young Mills field, which di distinguishes it from other uh, field theories. And indeed, this is a, it's a kind of present to us from authors of <laughs> Jan Mills field. Now, I still have a couple of minutes. Let me say what, uh, what is to be done, in, in fact. If we are not speaking about quantum homodynamics, homodynamics but just about Jan Mills field, we are to answer the question, what is the excitation? The, this is famous story coming from famous talk of Professor Young on the Oppenheimer seminar in 53, I think, when Pauli asked him, but what is the mass of your excitations? And for that, Professor Young answered, this is a difficult dynamical problem. So we are still <laughs> somehow living with this difficult dynamical problem, and we have to understand what are those excitations. Uh, they are not vector fields because uh, there are no, I think, I think that the main reason why Pauli rejected himself, because he knew uh, somehow the formalism of Jan Mills field, rejected it himself was that uh, charge vector fields don't exist in nature, so we have to understand something more. But what are the excitations? You know that even, uh, that Witten even proposed to mathematicians to think about it. And the Clay Institute proposes $1 million for <laughs> solving this problem. And, and until now, we don't know. Well, myself, I decided to look about some solitonic mechanism for that. Of course, solitons don't exist for classical young mills because of the scale invariance. Now we have learned that 
quantum Young Mills, the scale invariance is broken. There is parameter mass, and so maybe we are to find out what would be gluonium, pure gluonium, if they exist uh, as a uh, solitons of Young Mills. Solitons are then to be uh, this, uh, solutions of not of classical equation, but uh, equation which is produced by effective action, which I uh, propose to you. In fact, uh, this uh, my choice of B is really uh, some, I call it quantum field, uh, quantum equation of motion, which already have this parameter. But it, this equation, of course, has the main part, the classical field equation with some corrections. So with Niemi, we introduced the parameterization of Young Mills in terms of some sigma models, and one of uh, one particular part of it rem rem was reminiscent of nonlinear sigma model, which I proposed long ago, for which the excitations are not. Is it possible that something like that will happen in Young Mills theory? I say, why not? Uh, in quantum chromodynamics, people say that quarks are confined because they have strings of young mills which somehow take them into together. I, I cannot really, I still don't grasp how this mechanism really works, but let's say that people believe it so. So then I ask, what, what will happen if there are no quarks? What will happen in pure young mills? Strings are to be there, and the only way for those strings is to close and maybe to make rings or knots and so on. So from one time, one, one side we have parameterization of classical young mills which have the sigma model. Well, the sigma model which I refer to is well defined uh, classically. It has solitons which are knots. It's not explicit formulas, but things are calculated on machine and so on. And we have, we see the signature of this sigma model inside of Young Mills. The one loop must give us mass which we need. So that's a real challenge somehow to understand if these knots will appear, well, at least in the one loop of quantum field theory where coupling constant disappears, we have now M and so on. So this is. If I was younger, I would work on it myself. I, fortunately, now in Russia, we have a revival of interest to physics from young people. So I have a couple of young students whom I try to make to work on that. And hopefully, uh, the answer to Paul's question will be just in terms of this sigma model. But this is, of course, hypothetical. So thank you very much. Excuse me. Yeah. This formalism, which is set up with the effective action and everything, what happens if you do it for n equals four when you have the beta function b zero? No, but it's not zero. No, in in, in n equals four, young ah. Oh, in case when, but uh, well, then things will be fine. But I don't like it. I think that it was very important that we have better. No, no, function. that's one thing. But but <laughs> but my next question. Yes. Um, so we believe, you know, in the, the large end limit that this is an integrable model. Would you be able to see that in this formalism? Um, I did not look at it myself, no, not yet. But my main thing today was to, exist, to advertise that this uh, a, a, a <coughs> functional of external field is very important. And this external field also satisfies this kind of quantum equation of motion correction classical equations. Well, my, my other question was that we know that, uh, you know, for certain supersymmetric field theories, you have this S duality, so you, you, you can, the, the same theory in the sort of um, solitonic sector, or monopole sector, whatever you would li like to call it, is described by, by a different gauge theory, but it's, you know, it's somehow the same. You, you refer to Mandacinus, these things, no? 
Uh, yeah, this is more no cybergs, you know, duality. Mm -hmm. Could you? What would happen in your formulas? You haven't thought about that. Well, you know, uh, I'm old man, <laughs> <laughs> so mm, when I realized what I told you, I was so <laughs> I decided I must advise it. But uh, I will work on four-dimensional young mills without supersymmetry. By the way, Ludwig, um, since it takes you some time to go back and <laughs> in 1974, where we were both uh, 76, so we were both at the Zurich. 75. 75, okay. <laughs> in my lectures there, this was presented sort of in a different language. Yeah. But I also, at that time, reported on you know what really convinced me that this your goal that you're trying to realize now works. It's something you might look at because it's a beautiful example of, of everything you talked about. Let me finish. Which is the so-called gross nouveau model, in which you, uh, one, of course, that's an asymptotically free theory with a, with a dimensionally, dimensional transportation, a mass scale, and of course you can solve it. And it's in fact an integrable theory to all others. Yeah. And there, as you know, uh, there are sigma particles which can be regarded as uh, solitons, uh, but, uh, and the effect of action can be exactly calculated, and everything you talk about is quite explicit. That's well, what, in 1974, which is now 41 years ago, convinced me that, uh, that, the, that asymptotically free theories could produce a mass gap and you could identify what in QCD would be the glue balls and calculate their properties. No, of course I remember this nice time when we met in 75. Uh, and at that time I was advertising solitonic mechanism. I also have lecture. Besides the yes, teaching yes. you function integrals, I also <laughs> gave a lecture on uh, St. Gordon, right. where we have a lot of excitations and so on. But it's two-dimensional. So. <laughs> No, 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 but the... Uh, well, so, there, I'm not against two dimensions. There, there but. are other... I was just going uh, use the simplest model. There are also now four-dimensional models where one can... Yeah. Uh, can... I mean... Um, for, uh, but, but that is a, a nice example, if you wish. Uh, I mean... Not solitons in the sense of theories with a gap, but solitons in a case where you have, so the sigma field, psi bar, the excitations of yeah, that yeah. theory, the singlets, yeah, which yeah. develop well, a mass gap dynamically via dimensional transportation, can again be viewed as solitons of, uh, of the effect of action. Well, of course, I, I my. It, as soon as I understood that cartesian de Vries equation, solitons are particles, I will always work on this. I have even lecture notes somehow from young Mills to solitons and back again. So I'm very much in this. But uh, as you say, what plugged all this was two dimensions. And when I was somehow now begin to think that in four dimensions also maybe the solitonic mechanism works, I'm trying to present it to you. No. Okay. You mentioned briefly about the need for condensate. Is there a need for condensate? Mentioned in dimensional transmutation. Condensate. Excuse me. Repeat. Uh, is there a need for a condensate in this? Condensate? Yes. Well, for those uh, sigma model which I need, uh, I don't need condensate. But of course, uh, well, in young mills, it, we are now to, ex is, for instance, to exclude mu completely from effects affection. And so instead of mu, there must appear some physical entity, like F mu squared by Savidi. 
And so I believe that something like that must happen here. I plan to discuss with George <laughs> the pr procedure of this type, yeah. But clearly, I think one of these things, you have very explicit formula, one loop correction. It's written, it's, uh, it definition depends on this parameter mu. Better excluded because things are not dependent on you. And so the only way is to introduce something dimensional from physical entities. One of them is f mu squared. But we have to know what, we have to see what happens here. 